When I say the name William Shakespeare, you probably think of the English playwright. Uh, but today, you may know by this first photo that we're talking about fishing. Not quite. But there was a man named William Shakespeare in America uh, in the late 1800s who founded a Shakespeare Fishing Reel Company uh, that made many advancements in fishing. Now, what has that got to do with this photo here? The ultimate treasure trove a barn full of unrestored pre-war Bugattis. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, his son was named John, uh, and here's John here with the Bugatti Royale. So John, being the heir to uh, a large uh, fishing equipment company, kind of had the freedom to do uh, what he wanted, to pursue what kind of hobbies he was interested in. Um, this included in the early 50s uh, racing Ferraris, uh, with Luigi Cinetti, Cinetti the um, US distributor. They ran at the La Carrera Panamericana in a 375 MM. And then in, later in the 50s, uh, he became interested in collecting a car by the name of uh, Bugatti. And his first purchase was a Type 55 Roadster, possibly the most um, desirable sports body Bugatti built. Uh, so not a bad one to buy into the first car. And his second car was this, uh, a Bugatti Type 41 Royale, as it were, 106 in the world, chassis 41131, in the park ward car, uh, limousine. And this is our other character in the story. Uh, this is a Swiss, Swiss textile, textile magnate named Chris Schlumpf. Um, and Schlumpf, here he is, next to yet another Royale. Granted, there are only six in the world. This is uh, chassis 41100, the uh, Coupe Napoleon. And um, he's another character in the story, and the, the reason will come into play a little later on. So John builds up this collection of 30 cars, um, from very early four-cylinder cars uh, to Type 55s, 57s, and a 41, being the highlight of the collection. And together the collection and has fun with it and has one mechanic faithfully restoring cars one at a time in his Illinois garage a couple hours north of St. Louis. Well in 1956-57 um, a man by the name of Hugh Conway in the UK approaches uh, Prichlum who was beginning to collect Bugattis and other uh, really top motor vehicles and said, I will make you a register of all Bugatti chassis in the world. And that became his mailing list, um, to, to quote an article about, about Shakespeare. So when he you know, saw that, okay, John Shakespeare in the United States has 30 cars, great. How do you build a big collection quickly? Buy other collections. So he approached Shakespeare with an offer and they went back and forth. And uh, a lot of the reason why Shakespeare was, was willing to sell was that, um, he had embarked on some restorations and then he would kind of get bored with it and, and move on to the next thing. Um, so they finally ended up uh, came, coming to a deal uh, on the cars and um, many, many people say that Fritz Schlumpf paid $85,000 in 1964 for a Bugatti Royale and he got 29 other Bugattis for free. Now granted that would be $813,000 today. But a Bugatti Royale, if it were to come to auction, could sell for over a hundred million dollars. No one knows. The last time one came to public auction was in 1987, and it sold for 9.7 million dollars in 1987 money. Uh, so it's it's really an unknown. Um, so here you can see Shakespeare and kind of his two passions. So there's an early 50s, or mid 50s Ferrari, possibly a 250 Buona. I'm not positive. Um, and what looks like the front of a Type 55, and a variety of the different um, Bugattis. Uh, so here was the method by which the cars uh, went from his home in Illinois to um, Alsace, France, where Fritz Schlumpf was putting together a museum in one of his uh, textile factories. So they loaded them. Uh, luckily, where he was keeping them on his farm, there was a train track, a uh, set of train tracks about 40 feet away or so. And so they pulled up uh, with a few open train cars and loaded all 30 cars onto the, uh, the train cars. And the only protective measures that were taken were 
might be in the picture here. Yes, they put plastic on the steering wheel. That was it. Uh, he took you know some white house paint and put one through thirty on each radiator shell, and then he would write the chassis number on the front glass of the car on the windshield. Um, another incredible thing was that uh, as multiple people came and uh, on behalf of Schulp and uh, appraised the collection, um, a U.S. Bugatti collector approached Shakespeare and bought all of his parts at a very low price. So these were all his spares from all 30 cars, loaded up a tractor trailer, and it was some low price, maybe $3,500, and, and drove away. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so he loaded them up, and they were all trained down to New Orleans, where they were put on a boat and, and went over to France. And here's Shakespeare with his cars. So you can see very early cars, perhaps a type 13. I'm not positive there. That one, uh, two. There's a uh, type 57 Gabler, which is a really uh, rare car. And you can see two type 55 roasters, just pretty incredible. Um, and loading one of the type 55 roasters onto the train and really just, uh, you know, not a ton of care for for the cars, um, but then again, he was buying these cars in the late '50s, and you know the cars weren't all that old, so they were in fairly good original condition. And when a kind of an inventory was made there and then over in France, as they began to go through and look at restoring the cars, they realized, well, some of these cars are in good enough condition, we can do sympathetic restoration. So there's. 41131 here. So it's the Park Ward bodied uh, limousine uh, Royale, and it has um, a fabric rear interior and a black leather um, uh, front section for the driver. And in, in some notes, when it was inspected at the time, at the time they said, you know, all the interior was in great shape. So can you imagine? And a lot of that uh, has been left alone, as we'll get into later. Uh, that car was first owned by Captain Foster, who is an English guy. Um, an English uh, captain, and his mother, uh, he was the heir to his mother's Boston department store. Um, so the car was uh, tagged with Eng English plates when Shakespeare bought the car, um, but he bought it somewhere in the US, perhaps Boston, I couldn't find the exact location, but it was noted that he drove the car the multiple hours home at the time, um, in around 56. Um, the car, as you can see in this photo, was uh, fitted with what were called artillery tires um, under the first owner because, um, uh, or sorry, sorry, uh, there was a guy named Jack Lemon Burton who was a UK-based Bugatti dealer who bought it from the first owner in 1946. Um, and he fitted it with those tires because of perhaps the weight or something. And when he did that, he had to cut the apron of the fenders a little bit and it remains that way today, although it's been fitted with regular tires. And here's the car a little bit later. Okay, so some things about the Bugatti Royale. They're powered by a single overhead cam in line eight, and the crankshaft, if you pulled it out of the en uh, engine and turned it up on it, would be taller than any of us. Um, they're an absolutely massive motor, and there were trains in that same period when um, Bugatti built six of these cars, and it wasn't that they built six and they were done. They couldn't really sell them. They were very opulent and, and, and expensive uh, at a time when it was post Great Depression and everything else. And um, so they used the engines to power trains. So they would have two inline eights in a very high speed train. Um, and they're just an incredible car. Uh, lots of great points of engineering. And each one is unique in coach work um, and, and mechanically unique as well. So here the car sits at Fritz Lump's museum, which that could be a whole nother hour long presentation. We won't get into all that tonight, but this photo was taken in 1977. And you can see the car looks fairly close to um, how the car looked in, in 64 when Schlump bought the car. Now, what was done to the car, we don't know because the cars were somewhat restored behind, behind closed doors or, or prepared for display behind closed doors. So no very much public record of whether the car is fully restored or anything like that. But from these photos, we can presume that because the car was in good condition, maybe a lot of finishes were left alone. But who's who's to really know? Um, and you can see a really wild thing about the Schlump as it was originally set up, and it, it mostly is today, 
uh, everything was on gravel, and then in the, um, in the 60s, uh, when they were setting up the museum, uh, Fritz and his brother, who owned the textile business together, had uh, 1920s style uh, street lamps, based on uh, street lamps that were uh, in Paris at the time, uh, which really was fitting with the cars. Here's the same Royale today. Um, and you can see um, a lot of finishes like the um, steel front end and, and things like that. They're just in uh, really uh, great shape, but they don't look over finished. So if you look at a lot of pre Bugattis, if a car has been over restored, things like that will basically look like chrome or they may be chrome. Whereas a lot of things should have been nickel plated and it ages a certain way, very different than chrome. Um, and it's interesting to, to look at retrospectively and you can see it's been returned to regular tires. Um, Uh, oh, the Coupe Napoleon that uh, Schlumpf was pictured with prior. Uh, he bought out of the Bugatti estate. Oh, let's just go back to that car really quickly. He bought this car out of the Bugatti estate, and um, it was said that the car was uh, custom built for Ettore Bugatti by his son Jean so that he could ride in it around um, Alsace um, at the factory and see cars being built. But some other theories said that, well, they managed to sell five cars and perhaps the six, they really couldn't get anyone to buy it. And so the Torre uh, took uh, possession of the car. Um, Jean died young in a Type 57G tank, uh, but his sister, Lebe, uh, lived on into old age. And so when her estate was settled um, and some of her further relatives, then some various um, Bugatti family heirlooms, cars, and other ephemera uh, went out into the world. Um, so that's a little bit about Shakespeare. Um, he had some incredible hobbies, and he built what was the largest Bugatti collection at the time in the 1950s and early 60s, and it was all done here in the Midwest. And I think that's kind of an interesting story. Very good. Thank you.